Okay, welcome everybody, database systems indexing part two today. Last time we started with B trees. Most important things again. So we said that we have nodes in such a tree and the nodes correspond magically to a page, four kilobyte, eight kilobyte, you name it. So we wanna have an index structure that works well in the storage hierarchy and therefore we don't use these tiny little pieces you would see in a binary search tree, but rather we have a page oriented structure. And then I try to give you some intuition on how these trees actually work, how you would build them bottom up. We looked at these properties in particular. So we have two different uh, node types. We have nodes. Yeah, it's somehow confusing the uh, terminology. So it's nodes, sometimes called internal nodes. That's this one here. And then there's leaves. Yeah? So the nodes have outgoing pointers to um, a layer underneath, could be Another node could be another leaf underneath, or other uh, nodes, other nodes and other leaves underneath. Um, depends on the height of the tree, of course. Yeah? And then such a tree has certain properties. Most of them are for historic reasons. So one, this property here is basically saying the node should be half full at least at all times. So there should be k to 2k entries in such a node. The same holds for the leaves. There should be k star to 2k star entries at all times. This is, um, this constraint is like uh, softened in, in real implementations most of the time. So we don't see it that strictly, but the textbook version is something like that. Yeah, and if a node or leaf is a root, that's this part of the table, then there's no such constraint anyway. Uh, you may have a node that only has a single key as an entry, or you may have a leaf that has only a single key value pair as an entry. In particular, assume you built a B tree for a relation that only contain, contains a single tuple. Yeah, then the tree is equal to one single leaf, of course, and that leaf contains that key value pair as its entry. Yeah. So the B tree has interesting properties. One is it's perfectly balanced at all times. We will look at that, how that works, and why it is like that, how it is maintained. Today, there are no values in the index nodes. Everything sits on the leaf level. All data sits on the leaf level. And that's required for the ISIM property. We also looked at the last time, that's the interval partitioning we discussed. Um, I think we can skip over that. That's kind of trivial. So that's this special property you don't find in a standard tree. That's called ISIM, index sequential access method, meaning if you want to do a range query on such a tree, yeah, assume you want to find all data items in between 34 and 72, including on both sides, you simply convert this to a point query where you look up the 34, yeah, you run down the tree, search the root node, the node in this case, find this leaf, find the 34 entry, and then you scan along the leaf level. Yeah? You have these extra pointers, this double linked list in between that allow you to hop from leaf to leaf directly. So all leaves are organized in a double linked list in addition to being part of a tree. Okay, so that's this ISM property which allows for efficient range queries. Yeah, and then we looked at the operations in the tree. So I told you that, okay, this initial example just gave you an intuition. A real B tree implementation would perform the insert differently. So how would an insert work? And here's an example, so assume you want to insert 74. So how do you insert 74? Well, let's first try to find 74. Let's convert this into a point query. Now, do I have an entry 74 already? So again, you start here in the root node, you run down the tree along this uh, yellow arrow, you end up in this leaf, and you say, now you see, oops, there's no room left to insert another key value mapping. Yeah? In the example, I say that for on each page, on each leaf, I can only insert four key value mappings. Uh, if I want to insert a fifth element, the fifth element, nice movie by the way, it's impossible. What do I do? I have to split this leaf. So that is the operation we perform. So basically the original um, page is maintained. We keep that one. <clears throat> However, these two entries here on the right are moved to a new page. So I create, create a new page move these two entries there, and then I have to fix the pointers and I have to fix the parent node, of course, uh, in order to, um, to maintain the properties. So you see it here, we have a new arrow here. This yellow arrow was inserted, that's a new page. On the new page I also inserted um, the 74 entry. 
and I have had to fix something here in that node. Yeah? Before we had only two keys here, now we have three. Okay, so here's a side-by-side -side uh, comparison of what happened. Two keys, three keys. Yeah? If a three keys can separate four children nodes or four children leaves in this case, before I could separate three children leaves in this example. Yeah? So basically, <clears throat> what I'm trying to tell you is when you insert something and you end up in a leaf that's already full, you have to do something special. If you insert something in the leaf where there's room left to insert the key value pair, everything is fine. You just insert it. All good. Yeah? So for instance, in this example, down here, assume you wanted to insert um, whatever, 68, for instance, yeah? If you insert 68 in this example, you basically run down the tree, you end up here, yeah? And then you can put it in between 67 and 72, but you don't have to split anything or fix the structure of the tree or something like that. That's not required. Yeah? It's only required if there's no room left. And that is done by the split operation in the B tree. And you see already one property of that operation is it doesn't change the height of the tree. It's unmodified. Yeah? All the ch uh, children nodes here still yeah, this is, have the same distance to the root node as before. Yeah? It's not changed. Yeah, and then basically that's where we stopped. So we looked at that uh, insert operation um, and I told you the best way to implement that is using polymorphism. So basically when you implement that you use an abstract node where you define uh, your methods and then you have two uh, subclasses, node and leaf, where the methods are overwritten accordingly. For instance, the insert method. You should have an insert method on the node, you should have an insert method on the leaf. Yeah? That allows, yeah, for, like that it's easier for, um, it's much easier to implement. You will see uh, how that works. Yeah? So um, let's go through that basically to give you an idea. Uh, I think we start with a leaf. It's easier to understand what happens here. So that's the insert operation in a leaf. So you run down the tree, eventually you end up in a leaf, as I just explained to you in the visual example. So what do you do? You check whether there's room left. So that is this keys variable. So this, um, okay, this refers to this leaf I'm currently in. If you're in Python, you would say self. Huh? What I'm trying to say you, okay, tell you, okay, there's an instance of the leaf I'm currently in, yeah, and this instance has an attribute um, that's called keys, and that gives you the current number of keys that sit in this leaf, yeah? So the counter of keys or the number of keys that are in this leaf, and I check, okay, is that already greater or equal to 2k star, because that's my constraint. I mustn't store more than 2k star key value pairs in this leaf. So if that's not the case, Everything is fine. I just insert the stuff locally on the leaf. Yeah? In other words, this else branch uh, is relevant if there's room left. Yeah? So I insert it locally on this leaf and then I return null comma null. That is a placeholder. You, you will see in a moment how that works. But if there's a problem, hey, the leaf is full, then what I do is I create a split. I, I split the leaf. And um, I do that by delegating it to a split operation that returns me a new leaf and a new uh, leaf pivot element. And then basically what I need to do is I need to check for the um, key I want to insert. Okay, is that smaller than the new leaf pivot element? Maybe I'll explain that again when I go to the visual example here. Yeah. So we're in this situation and we have already four keys in that leaf. Yeah? Now I have to somehow create an element that separates those entries. In this example, it's the element 73. That's my pivot element. That's the element I insert in the node and that will later on allow me to run down the right arrow, the right pointer, the right subtree in other words. Yeah? So that's this new pivot element I have to create, basically something in between. Again, recall, um, you can define once and for all what equality means. So here equality means you go right. Yeah? You see it here with this element. Yeah? You could define it for the entire tree to go left. We discussed that last time. But here it means it, I can go right. If it's a strictly smaller 73, I have to go left. Yeah? The 72, for instance, um, is here in this old leaf. Yeah, so that is this pivot element that's being created here in the example. 
where am I? Here am I. Yeah. So that's happening here. A new leaf is created. The leaf to the right, so to say. The new leaf pivot element is created. Um, and uh, that has to respect the data that sits on this um, leaf, of course. And then um, I check the key I want to insert. Do I have to put it on the left leaf or on the right leaf? Yeah, can be either case. Yeah, depending on that, I insert it on the left um, leaf or on the right leaf, on the new leaf. And then what I return here is the new leaf plus a new leaf pivot. And then now comes polymorphism and now comes the trick and the call stack basically. <clears throat> Recall that the uh, insert walks down the tree. So basically, when you <clears throat> do an insert on such a tree, you will call insert on this root node. The root node will find out, okay, what is the right subtree? And will in turn call the appropriate subtree, like this one. Eh? So the first insert will be calling the second insert. Once you're done, this insert will return and will go back to this method here, above. Yeah? So you can pass information to that method, which um, you can then exploit here to do something if required. Yeah? So basically, I'm creating a call stack and then um, removing elements from the stack again, I do something if, you're, if you're required. And that is happening here. <clears throat> so basically, that is the signal ID here. <clears throat> here I return null comma null, meaning there's nothing happening. But here, uh, if I split the leaf, I return the new leaf, comma, the new leaf pivot element. And that I can check for in the calling node, of course. Uh, the calling node can now check, oh, what did uh, the subtree return? That's basically uh, done here. Um, uh, where is it? <clears throat> Here, yeah, that's this call. Oops. Yeah, you find the choose a subtree, then you call insert on the subtree, and then you get something back. If that is null, nothing happened underneath, I'm fine. You can directly return. Yeah, basically, um, that's this one, return null, comma, null. But if say, this is not equal null, this is a signal for I split. Yeah, there was a split directly underneath myself. Yeah? Now I use that information to fix the, this node. Yeah? And if you go back to the visual example, you see, yeah, what do I have to fix here in this case? I have to go from there to there. So a pivot element has to be created. All of these pointers have to, uh, the, this right point have to be moved right. Yeah, there's a new pointer, blah, 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 blah. These things have to be fixed. Yeah? So you can exploit this call stack here and everything will magically be fixed. Yeah? So basically, <clears throat> I do that here. Um, so I check whether um, there was a signal return, so it's not null. And then there's the same problem as in the leaf. So if I have room to insert a new pivot element in this node, it's relatively easy. But what could happen is recursively, I may trigger another split. It may be that I have to split this node as well, because it's already full. Yeah, you see it here in the visual example. Assume I had those slots already. Yeah, they were, yeah, assume those were full already with uh, appropriate pointers, of course, going out. Uh, one, three, three, four, five. Yeah. And now um, I split a leaf, I go up, and all of those slots are already occupied. What do you do? You have to split the node as well. Yeah, and so forth, and so forth. Yeah, yeah that's basically uh, all the code you find here. Yeah, so it's, this is a check. Okay, overflow, that's a problem. Yeah, so I have to split this node as well. If not, I simply insert the new pivot element and the pointer to the new child uh, node in this node and everything is fine. Yeah? If not, I split recursively and pass the information up to the calling node. Okay, that is the B tree in object orientation or the, the, let's say the, the structural maintenance algorithm for the B tree. So what happens? If, let's assume, let's switch to, uh, this doesn't go away, right? <clears throat> so let's assume we're in a situation like that. Let's forget all about that. Now let's assume we are already here. We have here a leaf. Yeah, we have here another pivot element, whatever, 99. There's an error here, it's a double error, okay. So that's the situation, and now I insert an element 
in, let's say, this leaf. I insert 90. What happens? Yeah, insert 90 in, oops, insert 90. What happens? How do I do it? What's the algorithm? What happens with the splits? A bit louder, it's okay. Hmm? And now, well, first thing first, how do you determine the leaf where the 90 belongs to? How do you do that? It's, uh, than no, no, I don't want to know it's. I want to know how, what's the algorithm? Yeah? Yeah, find 90. Find point query on 90. So we start here, uh, try, do a choose subtree, find the appropriate node. Which one is it? Um, I think it's that one. Okay? That's maybe that's what, what you were saying, yeah? Now what? You want to continue or someone else? Yeah, we split it, that's correct. So this must be split, yeah? So basically we have to fiddle, we have to create a new uh, leaf, blah, 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 that has to be put here in the middle, and then we have to put an arrow here, all that stuff, yeah? What I just explained in a simple case. What happens here? We can or we can't? We can. We can't, yeah? We can. We can. Yes. yes, we can. No, we can't. Why? It's full. It's full? Yeah, it's full. Oh, it's full. Yeah, it's full. <laughs> Maybe someone else? Maybe behind you? With a... huh? Yeah, we split that one too. And now we need some more. Um, we have some more. Blah, blah, blah. No, I don't have room here. So basically, we split that one too. Yeah? We end up in a situation where we're like, huh? 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 Uh, how many notes do we have? We have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Perfect. So we end in a situation like that. Huh? Yes, yeah, so we have two, two notes here and six leaves, okay? And now what? Yeah, we need another root node here. I have to add another layer. Yeah, so what happened in this scenario was I split the root node. If I split the root node, that's okay, but I need to add another layer on top. So the entire tree grows by one layer. Yeah, so that would mean that I have to put something here. Boom, that's my new Tree, okay. Three layers, two layers of nodes, and uh, one layer, one layer of leaves, of course, always. Right, yeah. And that's not really reflected here because I ignored who is calling the root node. Yeah. So when you're calling the root node and you get the signal back from the root node in this implementation, hey, there was a split. Then you have to act. You have to inject another root node and uh, set the pointers accordingly. And that is the only point where a bee tree can grow in death, splitting the root node. Similarly, when you merge, um, uh, do the inverse operation and merge them back, that's the only point where a bee tree can shrink in the number of layers. Yeah? But before talking about that, maybe let's look first at the um, merge operations. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so this is the inverse operation, delete 74. So how do you delete 74? You do a find operation again. Yeah? You find, you run down the tree, find it here, kick it out, and now we're here. So the constraint is still valid. It's half full. Everything fine. Everything is fine. What happens if you do another delete operation? Let's delete 73, this one. So this tree underflows. Yeah? The, this leaf wouldn't be half full anymore, just one quarter. 
occupancy, and then you have to merge. Uh, that's the inverse operation of the split. Yeah? Now you basically merge two sibling leaves, and this example can also be sibling nodes, into one leaf, kick uh, one of the pointers, yeah, and go down from th three pivot elements to two pivot elements. Okay, like that you could also um, then maintain that constraint that it has to be half full. In uh, practical implementations, this is often neglected and not done uh, for performance reasons. There are also many optimizations you can do when merging. You, can, you don't only have to um, necessarily merge two adjacent leaves or nodes. You can do it across K sibling leaves and nodes and optimize um, yeah, the space usage uh, and so forth and so forth. Huh? But basically it's the inverse operation. Yeah, and, and then if you go back to our example here, yeah, basically if you do the inverse here, yeah, if you say we, you merge these two into a single node, then you would have to remove that old root node and end up that this becomes the new root node. It's the inverse operation of the split. So if you merge such that the old root node gets replaced or gets removed, that's the only place in the B-tree where the B-tree can shrink in its height. Yeah? All other operations never touch uh, this property that everything is balanced, that the path from a root node to any leaf has always the same length across the entire B-tree. Yeah? Or oh, no? Should I explain this again? It's okay. Magic? Yeah? Uh, how do we know which side we merge? <laughs> we merge from the, to the left or to the right. But inside, lo locally, we don't know which one is empty. Do we check both? Do we mm -hmm. monitor both entries? Both mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good question. You tell me. Whenever I say you tell me, I also have some time to think about it. It's, it's very helpful, right? <laughs> I can pretend I know it already, right? But you tell me. <laughs> Actually, I know already in this case. No, not always. <laughs> what do you suggest? Let's go to this uh, slide. <clears throat> what may happen, actually? Well, what is the precondition for being able to merge, by the way? Yeah? Yeah, and whatever I want to remove from my leaf has to fit in some other leaf, right? Yeah, so assume a situation where, um, let's say, these guys are full, right? Ah, then I switch to this permanent, there's two kinds of, okay, so let's, yeah, let's assume this is full and this is full. Yeah, now your underflow here, you remove the, what do we say, 73, and now you want to merge 83. Yeah, but who do you want to merge? All of those leaves are full anyway, right? So what could you do to stick to, yeah? Yeah, yeah, to fulfill, yeah, just to fulfill a uh, weird constraint people who invented the bee tree put in their paper to make sure that it's at least half full. Yeah? But it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Yeah? Huh? So that's a hidden assumption we have here. You can only merge if you find leaves or nodes to merge with yeah, that have still room to, to, um, to, to store the key value pairs um, you want to remove from this leaf. Right? Otherwise it doesn't make any sense. Yeah? So that's one thing you do, and that basically means you redistribute the entries over k different leaves in this scenario. Yeah? So when you merge, you can say, and that's a direct answer to your question, you could say, okay, I just look at my left sibling, you could look at your right sibling, you could look at the k left siblings, you could look k to the left and k to the right, stuff like that, and optimize. Gets complicated, yeah? one of the reasons that few people actually implement this thing. Yeah? So another thing you could do, and that makes more sense, is to, it's a similar problem like in the file systems, you could defragment the tree. Yeah, if you feel like you have many uh, leaves that are not well used, um, nodes as well, you could eventually try to re-optimize the structure of your tree in a separate path. Yeah? Nightly rebuild of the index or something like that. Yeah. So... 
Okay, here that's basically what I just said. So delete is the inverse of insert. Obviously, you first find the key, then delete the entry for the leaf from the leaf. Merge is the invert, inverse of split. First merge the two nodes into one or multiple nodes uh, or the redistribute as just explained. And then remove one pivot from the parent element if you merge. Yeah? That's what you could do. But depends really on the implementation, the different implementations. Yeah, so so much about these maintenance algorithms. It's so basically we have find operation or point query. It's the same thing, Search, searching, uh, finding, point query. It's the same thing. There's range queries. Yeah? That's a point query plus the isim property run across the leaves. And then there's insert and um, delete if you want. Insert is important to understand that overflow situations may trigger splits recursively in the tree and uh, maintain uh, the balan balancedness of the tree at all times. Okay, then there's special variants that are widely used in database systems, clustered, unclustered, dense, and sparse indexes. I will briefly explain those. There are more, of course, but those are the most impor important ones. We will look at clustered and unclustered. And um, uh, long story short, what, it, what some database systems do, newer don't do that anymore, but traditionally they did it like that, is that they say, okay, so we have our index, it's this stuff here, and all of that is oriented, um, organized along pages, plus we have the actual data. We have data pages. So there's a store where the data gets stored. You create a relation, you put data in the relation that's mapped to pages, and then the pages sit in the database store. Yeah. Now you create an index, so the, the index is created on top. Yeah? It's not part of the store in a way, it's on top of the data sitting in the store. Yeah? So basically those gray pages here sit in the store, that's the actual relation, and then you create an index on top. And somehow in this index, how it is typically used in database system, well it's one way of using it, let's phrase it like that, here you have key value entries. Yeah? So you have the key, typically uh, that's a primary key in the relation, for instance. And then you have a pointer pointing to that location in the store. Visually, it's symbolized here with an, uh, with an arrow. Um, technically, it's a persistent um, locator called a row ID. We don't have to go into detail, but basically it's a pointer that's stable on storage, so it's stable on the devices as well. And so it doesn't only live in main memory, but also lives in the entire storage hierarchy. And it allows you to get to that tuple. So if you're looking for the tuple that has an ID 73, you end up here, and then you do another hop to the appropriate page on, on disk, for instance, or SSD, and then you will be able to uh, load the data, the attribute values of that tuple. And why is it called a clustered index? It's called a clustered index because the order of the data on disk corresponds to the order of the leaves and the key value entries here in that example. I first show you what an unclustered is and you see it directly why that is a difference to an unclustered. Unclustered means, oops, also I zoomed in. Unclustered means the order of the tuples on the data pages but let's phrase it differently. The data pages are not ordered by the key used in the index. Yeah? That's another way of phrasing that. So uh, I use this key, yeah, this primary key of the relation here to organize my index. And of course, across the leaves, the stuff is ordered. Yeah? That's how we organize the B tree. But in an unclustered index, the order of those entries here does not necessarily correspond to the order on the entries in the store. And that is the reason why all these pointers go crisscross, yeah? because I have no idea how this stuff is ordered in the store. Versus, here it's the same order. Yeah? So you can easily uh, do something like that by sorting the data pages first across um, uh, using ID as a criterion, yeah? and then you can build that index directly on top. And then you, you never have any errors that go crisscross. Yeah, that's called a clustered index. And typically in a database table, there's only one clustered index, but multiple unclustered indexes. One clustered index because you can only sort the data along one criterion. 
yeah, not multiple unless they are correlated, then it works. But typically, you can only do one clustered index. Those concepts are relatively important. Um, you also see it in uh, products. Let's drink some water. Most database systems, when you um, create a table and you define a primary key, you don't have to, um, the database system will automatically create a clustered index on the primary key for you. You don't have to do it manually. You can manually create more indexes if you want, uh, including primary um, um, and clustered indexes, yeah, but that will be created automatically for you. Yeah, unclustered indexes are typically not automatically created. You can do that manually. Create index on tra la 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 la, you, you define the key, and uh, then that can be used in query, exploited in query processing. Yeah? Clustered, unclustered. Then there's dense and sparse. What does that mean? If that's a dense in the index, and dense means um, there's one entry in the index for each tuple uh, in the data. So basically means you have your data pages here with your tuples and you see for each tuple on the data pages there's an incoming arrow from the index. Now the index has an entry for each tuple here, but you could say, no, why? I don't have to do that. I could do it like that, right? And you, here you see that um, the green, um, that the index gets um, much um, flatter. You only have a single layer index consisting of a, <coughs> a single leaf. And what, so basically here, um, those entries point me to the right page. Yeah? So if I look for any entry in between 11, uh, 11 and say um, 67 excluding, I go to this leaf and within the leaf I still have to search for the tuple or even to search for whether the tuple exists anyway. Yeah? But I don't have to, like in the dense index, first go down the tree, find the leaf, and here jump directly to the tuple, but rather I just get a pointer to the appropriate data page and within the data page I have to search. Okay, that's called a sparse index. Do you see an advantage or disadvantage of using that? What could be an advantage? Yeah? It's more memory efficient. Yeah, the index is smaller, obviously. If you just see here how many leaves you don't have to use anymore, it's just a single leaf. Yeah, all of this gets thrown away. Have a single leaf, fix the pointers, or fine. Yeah, that's good. Other advantage, disadvantage? Yeah? Yeah. You use constant access. You use constant, constant access time. Constant access time? Yeah. In the dense index, you can access any element. You have one memory access for the sparse index. You have to, you have to read the page and then sequentially. Oh, yeah. oh, wait, wait, wait. I mean, here you have accesses here, here, and here. That's at least three accesses, right? Yeah, sorry. I mean, from the leaf to. Yeah. Okay, okay, ah, you mean from the leaf. Yeah, from the leaf already. Here you get the precise location of the tuple in the store. Yeah, that's right. Here you don't. You only get a, a rough location, like it's on this page. That's the information this, uh, you get from the uh, leaf here. It's on that page somewhere, I, I don't know. Is it? Or did I just do a miss? Did I just, was I imprecise? That, that sounds complicated, but it's perfect. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, typically you do it like that, yeah. Right, you jump to the page and then within the page you do binary search as well. Now let's hope there are no holes like here, binary search still works, these kind of uh, awkward things, but that's correct. Okay, but to uh, what is, <coughs> um, told you before, there's one interesting thing here <coughs> that makes actually a difference in query processing. 
We will get to that uh, later and we'll talk about how queries ac are actually processed in the database system. What does the information tell you here in such a leaf versus, he oops, versus here in this leaf? There's a huge difference. Yeah, someone else? No, then you, okay. Yeah. Uh, exactly. That's what I was aiming for. Very good. So here we don't know whether a specific key, not even the pivot elements, the pivot elements could have been chosen just to separate two entries. It yeah? doesn't mean that the pivot element exists in the tree. Yeah? So when I'm here, I don't know whether a specific key, let's say, um, whatever, 83 exists. No idea. I first have to go down and look, look it up in the data page whether it's actually there. Yeah? I mean, I could like, like say, okay, I mean, there is a range here between 67 and 83. So, or the, no, the, so there's probably uh, some entries here. I can make some mass like that, yeah? but that's very risky. Main message here is when you're here, you don't know yet whether the key you're looking up exists. Versus in a dense index, if there's an entry here, you know there must be a tuple in the data store. And that is important if you have existence queries, if you want to know whether the key exists in your relation, uh, whether a specific primary key, foreign key is present in the relation. You can stop your search here. You don't have to go to the data because the index allows you to answer the data already. There's no need to go to the store. Yeah? That's sometimes uh, very um, important. Huh? So, and you will see, of course, when you can do the similar, um, yeah, I could argue if, I mean, what if I color these green, right, and call them my B tree leaves? Yeah, the two concepts flow into one another. The boundary is very, very shaky. Yeah? And that's basically the reason why some modern systems um, don't have a store, yeah? but they basically do only this. Yeah, so they have one index, the index contains all of the data, and uh, if someone else wants to access a certain tuple, okay, um, you have to um, scan the leaves of this tree, and that basically replaces your store. Uh, so, so, so two concepts can be uh, they flow into one another. Huh? Okay, so that's the cost granular index. So what happened here? Here we have one pointer for each page in the index. Here I say now I just make it every other for each um, two pages I will only create one entry in the index. Yeah, that's a coarse granular index. Yeah, this already, the sparse index is already coarse granular so the granule is one page. Here the granule is two pages and what is this? It's no index. Uh, basically saying the granule, if it's four pages, if my data store is only four pages, then the index wouldn't help me to, to, um, to find uh, data quicker yeah, than just simply scanning the data. Yeah, so that's a parameter. That's what I'm trying to tell you. The, 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 the granule you're setting here is a parameter you can play with. Granule one tuple versus one page versus two pages whether four pages versus whatever you do deem useful to um, partition your data. Okay. Yeah, let's, with that, so th these B trees have been invented in seven, actually 50 years ago, in 72, yeah, very old, and I think even before that, Donald Knuth uh, wrote about that, um, similar indexes. So it's a very old idea, and the interesting thing about B trees is, you may think, okay, that is for very old computers with very slow hard disks, blah, 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 blah. But it turns out that this is an index that can be used across the entire storage hierarchy. Yeah, what you fix typically is, depending on where you want to optimize the index for, is to say, okay, what is your page size? Yeah? So there have been proposals that said, okay, my page size corresponds to a sector on disk, or on an SSD, or you could say even you make it a cache line size. Yeah? So memory from DRAM to the register is fed, uh, fetched in, in a certain chunk size, and that's a cache line size, typically 
I think it's 64 bytes or something like that. Yeah. And some um, variants of bee trees have experimented with that, yeah? setting the node size and leaf size to 64 bytes yeah? to have the index um, exploit the storage hierarchy super well. Yeah? And you see that um, over and over again. Yeah? So it's just a matter of tuning the constants in such a bee tree. The, the general structure of such a tree is unchanged. Yeah? You can use it on any modern hardware architecture with only minor modifications. And one modification I want to show that is interesting if you talk about memory effective indexes. So in the 80s and 90s, basically all database systems stored their data on disks. And then from the 90s onwards, people realized, oh, I have so much main memory available. Why should I even put it on disk? I can keep all my data in main memory. OK, we will talk about the asset problem here later on. You want to make sure that you don't lose any data. But for query processing, you can keep all data in main memory. Yeah, and, and that is way faster than accessing stuff from disk or SSD. And one trick um, that can be applied uh, also to other structures, but for B-trees, um, it was quite interesting at the time when it came up, was something like that. It works as follows. So assume. A, yeah, I'm writing a two-level B tree. That's maybe a footnote I have to make here as well. So how do you count the number of levels in a B tree? There are different ways. One is to count the number of nodes. Yeah. That's two node levels and one leaf level. Yeah, and then it depends on how things are counted. This could be called a two-level B tree or a three-level B tree. On this slide, I called it a two-level B tree. So if in doubt, better ask back. So we see a dense B tree. Yeah, I didn't. Um, Scribble all the data pages here, just a single data page. You have entries for each and every tuple, as explained before. And this is our tree. And we want to optimize for storing it in main memory. And one thing we could do is we could cluster the leaves. We could say, um, yeah, these leaves, I mean, theoretically, they could sit anywhere in main memory. Yeah? So we have a pointer to those leaves. And um, it doesn't mean that the leaves sit after one another. If you take the uh, virtual memory address of the pointer, it doesn't mean that uh, you have one page after the next page. So what you could do is, um, yeah. what you could do is you could cluster them and put the leaves sequentially on your storage device. That means you could get rid of all of those pointers here and just keep one pointer. That's shown in the next um, slide. So basically now I have a single pointer, this pointer here, pointing to the first, first leaf. And if I want to go to any other of those leaves, well, I, just, I know how big my leaves are. They have all of the same fixed size. So I, I just do some pointer arithmetic. I, I take the address of the start pointer and multiply uh, number of, um, that's basically shown here, yeah? so that's the offset, that's this uh, memory position, and then depending on where the, uh, uh, the slot I want to go to, the page I want to go to, I'll take slot times page size, and with that you can jump, for instance, for this leaf here, if you want it. Yeah? Is that trick clear? Just point arithmetic, yeah? You go there, you basically represent all those four leaves with the same pointer and if you want to jump to any of those leaves, yeah, just add, okay, one leaf, um, one page size, and then you add the second leaf, two page sizes, you have the third leaf, and so forth, and so forth. And you do the same here, of course. Yeah? Okay, that has an effect recursively because now you can kick all these entries here. Yeah? You see it here. We, previously, in the node, we had room reserved for being able to store those pointers to the children, note, children notes or leaves in this case. Yeah? This room is not required anymore. Yeah? So basically, that is the situation we're in. And that means such a node can now not only store three keys, three pivot elements, but six, which means I increase the number of children nodes from four to seven, always plus one. Yeah? Previously, uh, I had three, I could uh, store four pointers. Now it's six, I could store seven pointers. So that increases what we call the fan out. The fan out is the number of outgoing arrows from a, um, from a node. And the number of 
subtrees, the number, number of children nodes, that's called the fan out. Yeah? And that increases from four to seven in this case, which of course allows me to reorganize my tree differently. I could say, okay, I could do, I could do it like that. So I put, put my six um, keys here, yeah, all of them, um, now they map to this um, chunk of leaves. On top, I need an extra entry, that's my root node, to be able to um, uh, split to this eight um, leaf. Yeah? You see, I, I, on the way, I dropped the property that the B tree is balanced, but let's forget about it for a moment. I could do it like that. And you could recurse on that and continue. Actually, now I could say, well, what if I remove all of these arrows as well? What if I linearize the entire tree level-wise, node after node after node after node, eventually all of the leaves? Because this offset trick still works huh? across the other levels. That's what I'm doing here. So basically I'm saying, on memory, I store it like that, first node zero. From there, I know I can do the computation because with one page offset, there must be the next level. Yeah, and then again, there's an offset to the leaf level. Yeah? And like that, I could do the entire, um, yeah, I can basically remove all of the pointers in such a tree, okay? Yeah, I can compress it even further. Now I have room for one more element and so forth and so forth. Um, yeah, let's think about that for a moment. Why is it a good idea and why is it a bad idea? So I went from a structure like this, uh, ignoring the data pages, for down to something super compressed like that. Yeah. Yeah, if I insert, if I want to change it structurally, that will be hard. That's true. It's not the flexibility I completely gave away. True. Uh, when we need to split a little leaf in, uh, in the middle, we will need to rewrite a lot of things. Right. If you want to do a split on a leaf or on a node, we have to rewrite. Yeah? So any structural modification, structural modification meaning I split a leaf or node, I merge a leaf or node, I'm in trouble. Just uh, removing keys, uh, key, va key value entries, that's not so bad. That's okay. Yeah? But so structure modification is a problem in such a structure. What could be other advantages? Why do I do that? It's not only to, to torment you. Okay, some of the materials. <laughs> no. It's actually, the material we pick here is really... There's a lot of experience saying, okay, this is stuff that occurs over and over and over again. You should really know about that because it's, it has proven to be super efficient. Yeah? Uh, because in, in really condensed and very memory intensive. Yeah? Yes, yeah, so it's very efficient in terms of memory. Absolutely right. Yeah, I need less space to represent the same tree. All the overhead I had before for storing pointers, it's all gone. No point. Yeah, for, it's also very cache efficient. In particular, if you organize your leaves and notes along cache line sizes, it's also true. Yeah, what is another? Um, and he also said something interesting. Um, if I'm just reading, yeah, there actually are workloads, there are databases that basically only read. So who cares about supporting merge and split operations, structure modifications? Yeah? If, my, if I'm optimizing for reads, well, that's an index, index structure to go. Other comments, yeah? The clever I make my tree has fewer memory access than each block. Yes, act, actually that's one of the most important effects. Yeah? So I wanna decrease the height of the tree. And if you look at the original example, so basically, I mean, there's always this logarithmic effect like in algorithms and data structures, yeah? So we have three hops, whatever you are searching for, hop, 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 yeah? hop, hop, hop. And of course, the root node is accessed so often it will sit whatever in L1, L2, the next node levels, uh, um, nodes as well, hopefully, but the leaves you never know, yeah? 
And now we are down to a structure where there's only two. It doesn't have to be two necessarily, but the, the overall effect you have uh, by, by using a structure like that is you very likely decrease the depth of the tree, yeah? which means that very likely queries get faster because you have less hops in the tree. Yeah, that's the performance effect in those trees. Okay, here again uh, in text form the general idea. So you cluster all the nodes into one continuous chunk. So the nodes and the leaves kick all the pointers. You have a bigger fan out. So again, fan out is the number of children nodes or leaves from a node. Uh, that likely decreases the height of the tree. And with that, you um, increase the read performance. There was just a question here yeah, about the number of comparisons. Well, the number of comparisons probably you won't be able to do much. Here, uh, the performance measure is the number of accesses in the storage hierarchy. Yeah, so it could be here, here was the number of cache lines, for instance, the number of nodes. Typically, I just count the number of accesses across nodes and leaves. For sure, Within such a node or leaf, you do binary search or whatever to find stuff. You have a certain number of comparisons. That's another performance measure. And typically in a database system, the killer is not the CPU, but the storage hierarchy. The computations we do in database systems are typically so cheap that they are not in the way. We have time to do these things. Typically, our biggest problem is we have to we wait for the data. Or again, waiting for data, again, waiting for data. So the main question will become, okay, how do I organize my data that I don't have to wait for data that often? Yeah, that's a big problem in database systems. Yeah, and of course, there's a price we pay here. The update performance decreases considerably. Update not in the sense that you assign a different value to a key. That's all fine. But if you do a structural modification in the tree, be it through splits or merges, that is uh, awkward in such a tree. <clears throat> okay, so now we looked at how to insert and delete from a standard B tree. We looked at one idea, how to make it more, make the, make the rep representation of a B tree more efficient in main memory. Now we look how to create an index from scratch, given you already have a relation with whatever millions of tuples. The algorithm you could do to fill the index with the corresponding entries, of course, is you, for each tuple in the relation, you perform a standard insert in the B tree. That's fair. Yeah? So you want to create an index on a relation. You take yeah, for each tuple in relation, insert tuple into index. Yeah? Tuple-wise insert. That's one thing you could do. However, there, as always, are better algorithms, and the better algorithm the better algorithms are called bulk loading algorithms. And I will show you one of those algorithms, how it works. So that's our data. And we want to create an index on that data sitting on those data pages. So what do we do? We sort the data across the pages first. Yeah? So now everything is sorted by the key I will be using in the index. So the key again is the ID as on the previous examples. Now what I do is I do a sweep over the data pages from left to right and bottom to up. So the first thing I do is I create a new leaf on the first data page and insert the appropriate pointers. So you see this is a dense index. You can do the same thing with sparse indexes, doesn't matter. I do it for a dense index. So that's where we end up. I have one leaf yeah, where I have entries for that data page, but those data pages are not indexed yet. So I continue in the algorithm, I create a second data page connected by, uh, oops, connected by this ISM double linked list pointing to more entries. In this case to the three entries C and another entry on the next page. Now, well, yeah, of course I have two leaves. That's not really a tree. I have to create a node, an internal node. So I create a node here, okay? Continue with the algorithm, algorithm create the next leaf here and um, insert, oops, in that, insert that, um, insert a pointer to that leaf in the appropriate um, node. Yeah, like that you created an index for the data. So again, idea is first sort the data you want to index and then you do a sweep from bottom left to, uh, from left to right and bottom to top 
creating the required um, leaves and nodes on the way. Let's show it again. Show it again. Yeah, we sort the data. This is the sorted data already. From left to right, create the first leaf. Second leaf, you have two leaves, that's not a tree, so you create an internal node. Continue, create a new leaf, put the entry in that internal node. Eventually you're done indexing the data. Okay, does anyone see a problem with that? One advantage, let's look at some positive sides of these things. I mean, I wouldn't be showing that if that wouldn't have a positive effect. What is a positive effect or what is a negative effect? Yeah, someone else, maybe? Yeah, or Sie? Wir sind auch schon dran. Then it's you again, okay? How do we decide to put the tubules in what? Ah, no, okay, no, it's really like uh, I, I try to pack the leaves densely, as dense as possible here. So I know that each leaf has four entries, so whatever my next four tuples from the data store are, I'll take them in the leaf. And you see it here in this data page, you only have three. Yeah, so I can take another one from the next leaf already. Yeah, that's what's happening, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent remark. That's true. Yeah, here you don't have to make a computation here in advance. How many nodes leaves do I need? Who cares? Leaves is easily computed because number of tuples uh, divided by the number of uh, entries that uh, fit in a leaf, seal. Okay, easy. Yeah, then logarithmically you can compute the computation is not that difficult actually. You could do that. But uh, you're right, yeah? bottom-up, maybe uh, it's more complex and also bottom-up, how, how uh, I mean top-down could be more complex. How would that even work top-down? Actually, I showed you a slide about that, yeah? Mm, no, not necessarily. Yeah. But basically, you would do a recursive partitioning of the data, yeah? Which, which may boil down to sorting eventually. Yeah, so if you, do, if you want to do a top-down, you don't have to sort it in advance to do a top-down partitioning. Yeah? You would save the sorting step. Yeah? That's another algorithm you could do. I mean, if you, if you recall this, um, we had this slide where, we, uh, where I showed you this, and I'm still in part one. Oh. Um, to speed up a bit. Here, this partitioning. Yeah? So how you could do it, you could try to um, gather statistics on your data, make a linear scan on the data, try to get the distribution based on the distribution, determine the pivot elements, and then you partition your data uh, into chunks that are roughly equal in size. Yeah? So basically, you create one, one node, the first root node, partition the data according to the node, and then you would have four chunks. Yeah? And then you recurse into those chunks and run the same algorithm without sorting it in the first place. You need some statistics for that to make it happen. But um, yeah, a long story, sorry if I explain too much <laughs> sometimes. Um, okay, um, where am I? Yes, okay, so what is the advantage uh, and disadvantage of that? That was my original question. Yeah? Yes, yeah, yes, very good remark. So this is a textbook example. Yeah, um, creating the illusion that this algorithm is correct. It's not correct. It works sometimes, and it works for the example I'm showing you. Yeah, and why, when, when wouldn't it work? And that's what, what she just said, where's my pen? Assume, um, 
you created, uh, you had more data, one data page here. Huh? That's how I understood you. Yeah, and now, now what? What do you do? Hmm. Now you, okay, now then I have to insert a new node. The node has to have two outgoing arrows, right? But I only need one. Uh, now what? Broken. Yeah, so the algorithm doesn't work without modification. Uh, there's uh, actually the modification we will discuss in the lab. Yeah, we will have an exercise on that uh, where we discuss how to fix the algorithm such that it works in every case, uh, independent of the number of data pages um, you're trying to index. Uh, very good remark. Yeah? So this, uh, you have to be careful how to, how to implement the algorithm to make it work, but, but it's a minor modification uh, that, that, that guarantees that you will end up with a valid B tree. Very good. Um, what else can I say about that? Maybe we go to the overview slide. Um, I know, I know that's the entire B tree section slide. Um, yeah, so this algorithm also works for more um, layers, yeah, arbitrary number of layers. The advantage is, um, in particular, uh, if the data is already sorted, it's relatively cheap. Yes, so sorting can be expensive, in particular for large data sets, but if it's already sorted, it's relatively easy to create um, such an index. And as I said before, typically you will sort along the primary key of a relation anyhow. Yeah? It's the first thing you do, and then you create the index, relatively cheap, and um, then you're there. But there's another example, another advantage, again, compared against tuple-wise inserts, yeah, I told you, I mean, you can always insert into a B tree by, for each tuple, call insert on the B tree, right? What happens if you um, sort the data and then do a tuple-wise insert on a B tree? Takes the same data set as on this slide. Yeah? And now you do an insert with the stuff. Try to insert a tuple-wise. Yes, you do whatever. 11, 15, 34, 56. That's my leaf. I will go away in a moment. I need to keep on scribbling. Now what? You insert 67. I'll scribble it again here. We have that time. 11, 15, 34. 56, so this is your tree. Your tree is a single leaf. Now you insert, uh, what, 67. How, what, what happens when I insert 67 on this tree? Hmm? This is my tree. This is a root, no, root, root leaf, so to say. Yeah? What happens? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So the first thing is we find the key 67. Well, that's an easy case. We just do a binary search here, and we see. Oh, yeah, it uh, should be to inserted to the right of 56. Anyway, the leaf is full. We have to split it. So the split would perform something like this: um, 11, 15. Uh, the new leaf would carry 34, 56, yeah, isom. We create a new um, node. Could be any pivot in between 34 and 15. Let's say it's whatever, 33, something like that. Okay, and then I insert what? Uh, 67, I insert here. Okay, that would be the result. Yeah? So this uh, approach is that even though the complexity is expected the same as the, uh, the one that we suggested before, but actually there is much more operations than the one before, and so the yield is lower. Yeah, very good. So complexity is the same. That there's more operations. I have this find operations. I do this merges and all of these things. And also it's not really generally efficient to. Mm. 
Yeah, why not memory efficient? So mean in doing the operations. Yeah, there's another aspect of that, yeah. We end up with half empty leaves. Yes. Half, it's half full. Yeah? All of the leaves are half full, except the rightmost eventually. Is that what you said? Yeah. Even if you didn't say it, that, that's what I heard. <laughs> so it was good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, you always insert in the rightmost leaf. Eventually, that gets full. You split it in, in the half, and the, the, uh, the old leaf stays here, half full, and you continue inserting to the right. Yeah, so you, insert, uh, you end up with a leaf layer where all the leaves are half full, except possibly the rightmost leaf in that layer. And that's not very good memory usage if you compare that with what we had before. Here we can basically... All the leaves are, f or the leaves are brown. All the leaves are full, um, yeah, fully packed. On the other hand, if I use this algorithm and uh, now I do any insert in the middle, I have another split, right? That's a little bit better here in this approach. If I have an insert, the likelihood for a split is lower, right? Because there's always room. All of these leaves have room for two more elements, versus here, it's completely packed in this algorithm. If I insert anything, I will trigger a split, no matter which leaf. I will trigger a split. So it's a bad algorithm, right? What could I do to fix that? How do you bike load a tree such that you're still later on able to insert more tuples that not necessarily trigger a split. Yeah, someone else? Yeah. For instance, that's a parameter. You could even say it's only half full. You end up with the same um, tree as uh, the tuple wise insert. You could say, no, I fiddle like 80, 90 percent, leave some room for, for new elements to be inserted, depending on your workload. Yeah? So that's a tuning parameter. It's also called a hyperparameter in machine learning terminology. Um, yeah, <clears throat> okay, so that much about that. So summary for bee trees. Bee trees are awesome. Um, if, as I said, there are two index structures in databases you have to know about. One is bee trees, the other is hash tables. We will look at the third index structure today, but it's like B trees and hash tables, then there's for a huge while there's nothing. And then comes bitmaps. Yeah? We will look at bitmaps in a moment. They're so important because they can use like and adapt it to problems um, in like everywhere. These trees work well across all layers of the storage hierarchy with minor fixes, can easily be adapted to handle the many different types of data inquiries and they're still being extended and reinvented in 2020. Actually, we had a paper this year about bee trees uh, 50 years uh, after they were invented. Okay, so with that, I switch to part two of indexing. <clears throat> Again, we're here, still in this box, how to find stuff at scale through indexing. And let's look at bitmaps. And bitmaps are kind of easy. I, I will show some variants that are not so intuitive, but the, the basic uncompressed bitmap as it is also called is relatively easy. We're in a situation like this. We have a relation called colleagues with three attributes, name being the key. You should know by now that modeling wise using name as a key is a very bad idea, but for <clears throat> this slide example, I'm using it. So there's name, which is a key, street and city. <clears throat> and um, what I want to do is I want to support queries that um, allow me to quickly look up which colleagues live in a particular city? Which of the colleagues live in Cupertino, for example, or Berlin or New York? And I do that by creating a bit list that looks as follows. For each distinct value that occurs in this column, yeah, there, are three, there are only three distinct values, Cupertino, New York, Berlin. Those are the three distinct values. I create a bit list, so for New York, Cupertino and Berlin, and then basically, this is a bit list 
where the bit is set if city in the original relation has that value New York. Yeah, so here um, in this row here, yeah, the, the value is, um, of city is New York, so here the bit must be set to one, these must be set to zero, and so forth. Here's Copertino, this is true, false, false, and so forth, true, 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 and so forth. Okay, so a bitmap basically like a mask if you wish, it's another uh, term for that, a mask telling you, okay, whether this value in this row is New York, is Cupertino, and is Berlin. And if you think about our data layouts again, of course you could serialize that in this order, in the column layout. Yeah, that would allow you to do very efficient operations. Yeah, I mean, you can co compress 64 bits, uh, 64 of those bits into a word and do a single operation on that, or you could even use a SIMD reg register and uh, compare like 256 bits in a single uh, cycle. That makes it very efficient. Those are called standard bitmaps or uncompressed bitmaps. Pros and cons. Using bitmaps is a good idea. It depends, comma. On what? First, then I say, yeah, it's you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's you. Yeah. Yeah, very sparse. I mean, you can't just, I mean, you have to store all these zeros and ones, yeah? So you can do the math. You're absolutely right. Oh, I store these zeros. Can I do something? Compression, yeah? You could compress these. Run length encoding here is a good idea, typically, for these bitmaps that are very sparse, yeah? Because you have many zeros. Hope, let's hope for the best, yeah? One after another that you can encode like 0, 42 times, and one, 0, 500 times, and one. Yeah? Or other compression algorithms could be applied. Yeah? But anyway, you're right, it's sparse. Other concerns? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, right, correct, absolutely correct. In other words, if there are many duplicates, yeah, so duplicates meaning the same value occur occurring over and over again, then it's a good idea. In other words, only few distinct possible values being used in the column, good idea. That's the same thing. If all of these cities are different, the bitmap is actually not so great. Right? You could still make arguments for that, but typically then it's, uh, depends on how, how big the bitmap to scan is uh, and, this, and how you index different story. Yeah? But, but the general trade-off is um, if it's only few of those entries, then a bitmap may be a good idea. Okay, and obviously you could do the same for street. Yeah? Here it's, it's only, um, I changed it. You know, it's only these stupid street names, Uni Street, Max Street, Long Street, th four different streets. And then, of course, you could do all kinds of uh, logical operations. If you want to know all the people that live in city Copertino and in street um, Max Street, yeah, you can basically, Copertino and Max Street, you do a logical end operation on the two bitmaps, on the two bit lists, yeah, and then only the ones that survive signal you, okay, those are the two bits that qualify, that you're interested in. And again, if that is in column layout, yeah, if that is a column data layout and that is a column layout that can be done storage-wise also super efficiently and CPU-wise super efficiently. You had a question? Yes. Um, wouldn't the only benefit go away if you compress it? Um, not necessarily. I mean, in storage, in terms of storage space, it gets actually better. Yeah, because in particular, bit lists um, are typically accessed sequentially and scanned. Yeah, and if you can compress them, you scan them anyway, yeah, it could actually become faster due to compression. That's another example, actually, again, where you could operate on the compressed bitmaps to do the end operation, for instance. Yeah, and then storage-wise, you, you would have to read less data, yeah, better on storage, maybe pay a little bit more on CPU, but overall could be cheaper. Yeah. 
There are many systems that used from the 90s in particular that made heavy use on these uh, bitmaps, compressed uh, the, um, the bit lists, huh? bitmaps. So uh, I always say bit list and bitmap, just again as a clarification, what I mean, what's the, what is the difference? One of these things here is a bit list. A bit list two, bit list three. The entire thing is a bitmap. Okay, that's the terminology. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, then as explained, I didn't write it down here. Yeah, you can do the logical operations. You can determine, okay, who does not live in New York? Yeah, just negate that column. Who lives in Berlin and Uni Street? Who lives in New York or Long Street in any city? All of these things can be done through bitmap. Um, but it's logical operations. Okay. Next. So space comparison. Yeah, you can do the same thing. We skip over that. We did that. Um, um, yeah, in particular, when you filter data out from a relation, in particular large relations, so everything in SQL corresponding to the WHERE clause, then these bitmap operations will make a lot of sense. And they're actually used as a building block for query processing. Uh, who of you has used Pandas, the Pandas library? Yeah, there you would, okay. Uh, and who of those actually study DSAI? Ah, yeah, okay. <laughs> as, I, as I'm not tired in, uh, in mentioning that Pandas is not so ideal with respect to data, um, how the API is modeled, but when you filter in Pandas, you actually also create those bit lists, you may remember. Yeah? And then you put the bit list in the square operator, and with that, basically, you get the final result. Yeah? That's a very similar way of curing in Pandas. Yeah? Okay, just a footnote. Okay, so let's look at some other ideas here, in particular when it gets to space. So here's another uncompressed bitmap. Again, with the semantics in the bit list saying, is the value equal? Yeah? And now what we could do is, in, in such a situation, of course, well, basically, if you have another value showing up here, by adding, here you add more data, and you know, for each value occurring in the original column, you have to create another bit list here. Yeah? Now they have varying size because I, was, I said, okay, um, I, can stop, uh, I can stop the size eventually if I know there's, no, there's only zeros falling afterwards. I just store up to and including to the latest bit that's set to true. Yeah? That's one minor optimization you could do here. But anyway, if you have many of those values, you could also do something um, differently that's called a decomposed bitmap. And here, you don't store one bit list per, per value that occurs in the original table, but you rather decompose it, for instance, along the decimal system. So here, um, I'm using 30 bit lists for all values in the range from 0 to 999. So I'm saying, okay, <clears throat> with this, I represent the hundreds, with this, the tens, and with this, the ones. Yeah? And like in our decimal number system, I decompose any number into those bit lists. So I could say 653, or, no, let's do 42, of course. 42 <clears throat> is uh, the four bit list in the tens, that's why there's a one, and the two bit list in the ones. Yeah, and the sum of that, of course, then represents 42, obviously. And you can do that with each and every number. So 653 is the 6 in the hundreds, the 5 in the tens, and the 3 in the ones. Yeah, the sum of that represents 653, which means if you look up any value, you check for these three bit lists. Yeah, if you're looking for whatever, 323, you check the 3 in the hundreds, the 2 in the tens, and the three in the ones to determine whether the city value is set to this specific value. Okay. Um, yeah, and the advantage is, of course, for this particular example, you would uh, have to store only 30 bit lists rather than number of distinct values. So if the number of distinct values goes up, in particular beyond the 30, yeah. Yes. Uh, 
Well, they're mixing up two things. So the first thing you said is the number of distinct values is less than 30. I think the role, um, the, the colleagues relation only has 15 or so uh, tuples. That's true, so I can't be better. But once it gets uh, bigger, and once I have more distinct values than 30, so the 31st uh, uh, distinct value I'm inserting here would trigger the th 31st bit list. Yeah, and then I would use more space already. Yeah, so yeah, you're right, for this example it doesn't make sense, but in the general case if you have like a medium sized number of distinct values, then this could be a viable solution. Yeah? However, there's another price you pay. I just explained it actually. Yeah? Yeah, exactly. It's always times three, or if it's four digits times four, whatever I use as a representation. So again, there's a trade-off. Yeah? So database systems is full of these na nasty trade-offs. Yeah, it's not just to use something, everything is fine. You always pay a price for something. So again, it's a matter of, yeah, actually have to do like the back of the envelope calculation. Does it make sense, yes or no? There will be cases, it depends. What makes sense in other cases, it depends. Where it doesn't make sense. It's always like that. Yeah? For those bitmaps, would it make sense to make them uh, to use row layout? <coughs> Are you make okay, what you're suggesting is a row layout like this? Okay, but then you read a lot of data. You will also read the, the bits from all the other bit lists. Yeah, typically, if you look for like 653, I only have to read this bit list, right? So the ideal layout for you would be six concatenated with five concatenated with three for this particular number. Yeah, and as that's not possible due to all the combinatorial, yeah? it's clear. You make it in separate columns and then you read them one after another. That doesn't hurt that much. Yeah? But there's another thing you're seeing here, of course, and he mentioned it already, this is dictionary compressed. Yeah? So that's the combination of two compression methods you could be using here. So I compressed city down already. I mean, I can't use this decomposed stuff without doing dictionary compression before. Yeah? If you looked at this example, here we use the strings, yeah, the values that occurred in the headers, Berlin, Cupertino, whatever, as a header of the bit list. Yeah, but if I want to decompose it, if I want to decompose a number, well, I first have to convert it into a number. Oops, here I am. Yeah. And once it's dictionary compressed, I can decompose it um, with this algorithm. Okay. Um, yeah, bitmap operations I explained, that's what we talked about. Yeah, one more bitmap, <clears throat> that's called a range encoded bitmap, that's kind of funny, I wasn't aware of that until 10 years ago or something, I ran into that. But sometimes also makes uh, sense. So here's an example where the column is year of birth. So um, year of birth and then different um, years in that column. And the uh, uncompressed bitmap on the right is what we had before. So the semantics of a bit list is, is the value equal to this value, 1979, for instance. But I, but I could also change the semantics here. I could say, I could use a different predicate. Yeah? I could say, is the value smaller equal than a particular value? So when I look at any column here in this bit list, this means when a bit is set to one here, the actual value in the original table is smaller equal to this value, okay? It's not necessarily equal. I only know it's smaller equal to the particular value, yeah? So the algorithm to create uh, the bit list is written down here. So for each uh, existing value in the attribute, attribute being year of birth, for each row ID, row ID again is a placeholder for the different rows. Let's assume they are numbered from 0, 1, 2, and so forth, from 0 to 11 in this case. So if the value in the column is smaller equal, 
Yeah, that's a spe specific uh, value uh, you want to use in your bit list. Then you set, then you, uh, set the bitmap to 1, uh, which means the more you go from the left to the right, you will see um, more ones being set. If, it, um, if there's a 1 being set here, of course, the 1 must also be set in the bit list to the right, obviously. Yeah? Because if it's already smaller equal here, well, then it's smaller equal there as well, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense. Yeah? Well, you will observe that, well, interestingly, it must be like that. Yeah? All of the bits are set to 1 in this last column. That is the reason why, well, let's throw it away. That doesn't carry any information. Yeah? The biggest value here, a rule like that is that value, the value smaller equal, the biggest value, the answer to that is always true for each and every row. So you can throw away that bit list. Okay, that is what we end up with here. Yeah, and then you can do uh, certain operations. Let's think about how you do these operations. So the year of birth, smaller equal 1984. How do I compute that? Yeah, anyone else? Yeah. Right, that's the result. It's already here, right? Nothing to do. Okay. Year of birth strictly smaller, 1984. Hmm? Yeah, 1983, right? That's basically this column. Year of birth equals 1984. Yeah? Uh, yeah, minus, in logical terms, <laughs> you mean the right thing. <laughs> yeah, someone wants to jump in? Yeah? 83 um, X or... 84. Yeah, right, because if the, the case that one is on the left and zero on the right must not happen. That can only be zero and one, which is in that case then equal to and not in a way. So the bit, bit should be set in the 1984 column, but not, here's an example, in this column. Now, this is exactly the case where it's 84. So X or is correct and, at, and not should only be correct. Yeah? 1984 and not 1983, right? You're nodding because I'm the professor. But it's okay. So no, this is bullshit. You can, it's, it's fine. Any time, right? <laughs> I believe it's correct. <laughs> okay, year of birth uh, greater than 1984. <clears throat> yeah. Not, yeah, not 1984, yeah, correct. Year of birth greater equal 1984. Yeah? Nineteen eighty six and not nineteen year sounds plausible. Nineteen eighty six and not nineteen eighty three. Yeah. Sounds good. Any comments? Yeah? Yes, of course. Yeah, that, that's the other approach. Yeah, you can always use the inverse. How did we compute this one? I forgot it already. I'm old. Sorry. 1983. Yeah. So everything uh, that's here, you basically invert it. Right. Yeah. And I think the problem with the 1986 is you forgot that I th uh, threw away the 1987 column. Yeah. So that's just implicitly represented here. Okay, good.
With that, maybe we start a little bit with the bloom filter. We still have five minutes left. What's the bloom filter? That's another relatively important index structure. In many, many systems, uh, it's used. And the idea is as follows. It looks a bit like a hash table and a hash map, but the, the major difference being the array I'm using, so in a hash map, in particular if it's um, in place hashing, um, then the array you use for hashing, there you put the keys. Here, in this example, in the Bloom filter, I just have a bit list. So I have slots or buckets, as I call it here, and I have from zero to m minus one buckets, and each bucket only contains a single bit. Uh, can be set to zero, uh, to false, or can be set to true. Initially, it's all set to false. So how do I insert in such a Bloom filter? Let's assume I insert 42, 43, 42. In this configuration of the index, I send this key through three different hash values. That's a parameter. So we, I have k hash functions. So I compute the hash function for this key on hash 1, on hash 2, on hash 3. The hash value, I use modulo um, m, for instance, so I get a slot. I get this slot, I get that slot, and I get that slot. In all of these slots, I set the bit to true. Okay? Now, for every insert, I do the same thing. Yeah? Now, if I insert this value, again, I send it through the three hash functions. They give me three different slots. I send the corresponding ones, uh, the corresponding buckets to true. Yeah? And so forth, and so forth. Now, if I set a bit uh, for if I set the bit for twelve seven eight one, yeah. So I insert twelve seven eight one again. Three hash functions. I may end up in a situation where I want to set a bit that was already set by a previous insert. These things may happen in a hash table. You see it in standard hash tables with overflow chains. An overflow chain that's um, um, at the bucket yeah, where all the entries are kept that hash to the same bucket. That's the same situation here. It's so actually this, this bit you could argue has two colors, the one from the previous insert um, as well. <clears throat> so basically what that means is you set the corresponding bits and now you can do the inverse. You can search the bit map or the bloom filter whether you believe whether a certain... Let's be careful, Jens. Uh, you can search um, along the same lines. Let's search first, then you see the problem. Yeah? Now you do a lookup. Let's see, I want to check whether this element exists. Well, if that element exists, there must have been an insert operation where the three corresponding slots were set to true, right? Yeah, because that's the semantics. I just explained three hash functions, three different slots. Could actually be the same slot in theory, yeah? but uh, let's hope in the general case it's uh, three different slots. The bits were set to zero. Now I do the inverse, I look it up, I check those different positions, I see there's it's true, it's true, it's true. What do I know at that point in time? Yeah? It might be, it might be that the key was inserted in the bloom filter. These bits could have been set accidentally by other, in other inserts. It does not have to be that it was exactly the same key that set those bits. Those the semantics of a Bloom filter is as follows. If you find in a lookup any bit that is set to zero, it's guaranteed that that key was not inserted into the Bloom filter because it, you, it must have been set. Yeah? But if you find that all the corresponding bits are set to true, the key might be or might have been inserted in the uh, Bloom filter, but you don't know. So why would an index like that make sense? Well, in which situation do you believe a Bloom filter is a good idea? So it's not exact. It's uh, also called a probabilistic index structure because it can't tell you for sure whether it's in. It can tell you, it just can tell you for sure it's not there. It's guaranteed. Now, where would that make sense? Yes, as, as a pre-filter, yeah? If you have many, many operations, 
maybe insert operations, queries, and so forth. This Bloom filter is very handy um, to decrease the load, load dramatically by understanding I don't have that key. You don't, you don't have to process it any further. For instance, with what we just learned, you could even say, okay, I have a B tree, and you put a Bloom filter in front of the B tree. Yeah, before looking up the B tree, you look, check in the Bloom filter whether a particular key exists. The Bloom filter can t tell you, uh, no, it's not there, so you don't have to look it up in the B tree. But if the Bloom filter tells you it may be there, you look it up in the B tree, and then maybe you find it or you don't find it. Both cases may happen. Yeah? But the idea is to do some, something cheap to uh, avoid a lot of work uh, for, for those elements. Okay, with that, let's call the day. See you on Friday in the lab. Yeah?